We are the Evangelical Alliance. We want everyone in the UK to have the opportunity to know Jesus. We are an alliance of evangelicals, of churches and charities, entrepreneurs, grandmas, colleagues, neighbours, friends, loving God, serving each other, declaring with one voice Jesus is our King. We are an alliance of evangelicals, cheering each other on as we seek to be salt and light in the world. you find us everywhere! In places of influence. And where people are hurting the most. In Parliament, in government. Speaking out on issues that matter the most. In a changing and hurting world. We're transforming communities. Changing lives. With the amazingly good news of Jesus. We are the Evangelical Alliance. Собрание различных племен и народов. We pray, speak, listen and share. Through challenging times and choppy waters. We stand together and serve each other. We are the Evangelical Alliance. Together, we're making Jesus known. All good. Isn't it great to be together? And isn't it also great to be good news people in a bad news world? I don't know about anybody else, but my news feed at the moment is the worst news any other time during my lifetime. And yet we, as the people of God, are good news people. And I wonder if, before I dive into God's word this morning, I wonder if I might infuse you about uh, the Evangelical Alliance and invite you to do something really important. Uh, because I'm part of the team at the Evangelical Alliance, and, and I want to invite you, if you're not already a personal member of the Evangelical Alliance, to join us this morning. Let me tell you why that matters and how you can do that. First of all, you might ask, what's an evangelical? Well, an evangelical is a good news person in a bad news world. Evangelical comes from the Greek word evangel, which means good news. And secondly, we're an alliance of evangelicals. So we believe we want to be the answer to Jesus' prayer, that his church might be one. So what we do is the Evangelical Alliance, we unite good news Christians from across every background story, every ethnicity, every denomination, that we might be better together. You might ask, what else is an evangelical? Well, an evangelical, we, we, we believe in the Bible. We don't change the words of God to accommodate our culture. We want to see our culture transformed with the word of God. Secondly, we're people of Jesus. We believe that his life and his death and his resurrection was the most important moment in the whole of human history. That he's our God, but he can also be our friend. Thirdly, we believe in conversion. We believe the most important decision anyone can ever make is to choose to follow Jesus or not. So we want to see every single person in the UK come to know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. And fourthly, we're people of activism. We want to see the world become more like the kingdom. That's why it was evangelicals who were at the forefront of the abolition of the slave trade. More recently, that's looked like street pastors, Christians against poverty, food banks, whatever we can do to see hope come to the most hopeless in our society. And we've existed since 1846 to do two really simple things. First of all, we equip and we inspire the church, united around the gospel, to see people come to know Jesus. And secondly, we speak up at the highest levels of government on issues that really matter to evangelical Christians. Why? Because if we don't, who will? And so during the pandemic, we've been telling the stories of churches like yours making the difference in the community around you bringing light into darkness, bringing, bringing life to the dying. But we also believe in, in, in matters like free speech. Why? Because it shouldn't be a hate crime to declare that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. One example of that, there was a bill going through Parliament recently that would have enabled Ofsted to come into every Sunday school and youth group in the country, country and essentially vet what was being said. We thought that sounded more like North Korea or Saudi Arabia than the UK, governmental control of private religion. So we spoke up. And because of the strength of our membership, that bill has been kicked into touch for the time being. Isn't that good news? But here's where we need your help, my friends. Because when the government asks us how many members do you have, we need to give a number. And at the moment, we're about 19,000 individuals. The aim over the next 10 years is to get to 50,000. Why? Because then we'd be bigger than any other, po uh, any other political party that's not the Conservatives or Labour. So they have to talk to us before doing anything. We're thousands of churches, hundreds of organisations, but the strength of our voice depends on the strength of our membership. So if you're able to join us this morning, it would make a real difference. 
So what I'll do is I'll be hanging around at the back at the end, and if you can fill in a form like this. If you're part of a couple, you can tick the box that says join as a couple, we get to speak on behalf of both of you. It costs just three pounds a month to join us, and by doing so, you will be massively helping us strengthen our voice, but also you be helping people across the UK come to know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. As a thank you, because this really matters to us, we'd love to give you a couple of things for free. First thing I'd love to give you if you're able to join us is a copy of my book, The Best of Friends. Now this came out on Thursday. It's really new. You could be one of the first to grab it. But this book's about friendship. Why? Because I think in a fractured and divided world, we need to be really good friends. Jesus said, I call you friends. There's no greater love that they that, that have than they that lay their life down for their friends. I believe friendship's really important, so we'd love to give you a copy of that. Secondly, we'd love to give you a copy of this. It's called Speak Up. It tells you your rights and responsibilities that you have when sharing the gospel at work and in community. There's loads of people out there who say you can't share your faith at work. You can. You just can't abuse a position of responsibility over an employee. People say you can't wear a cross at work. You can. You just can't wear a life-size one because it's a health and safety hazard. <laughs> this was held up in the Houses of Parliament as a model of excellence for free speech and sharing faith. would love to give you a copy of that. And finally, and for some of you, I reckon this might swing the deal. I'd love to give you an Evangelical Alliance key ring. I know, I know, right? It's got on the end of it one of those posh trolley coins. So when you're short at Waitrose or whatever supermarkets you use on the Wirral, uh, you, can, you can use one of these. And all I would ask is, would you pray for us when you use this? Because it's a really contested space out there in terms of the Christian voice. But it's also an amazing time for the gospel in, the, in these times. So would you pray for us that we might unite the church, speak with a clear voice. And would you please join us today? Come and see me at the end. Thanks so much. Let's pray, shall we? I uh, am absolutely so thrilled to be here, but I really believe God wants to speak to us today. So why don't we pray? And I just invite you in your heart to pray a really simple prayer this morning. Dear God, dear God, would you please speak to me this morning? Father, would you please speak to me? Through your word this morning, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you've got a Bible, would love you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I want to read to us a passage that has been profoundly important for me during the last few years of discouragement, disappointment and bereavement. Paul writes, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 to 18. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I don't know about you, but I love that the Bible is real about life. We need to be real with God. We need to be real with one another and we need to be real with ourselves. There are moments in life where I've had to be real with myself. One of those happened a couple of years ago where uh, I went back to Sheffield where I went to university. So 20 or so years ago, I did a law degree in Sheffield. And um, back then, I was an evening person rather than a morning person. And my natural habitat was that of a nightclub. Well, I went back a few years ago to Sheffield, to the places where I used to go, and it was about one in the morning, and I was living my best life and still thought that I looked vaguely 20 years old. My bubble was about to be burst when this guy who looked about 12, he was probably in his mid-twenties, came up to me and said, 
where are you from? And I said, mate, I'm from Birmingham. He goes, how old are you? I said, I'm 37. He goes, shake my hand. You're a legend. I realized at that point I no longer looked mid-20s. My son also did this to me recently. I've got two boys, uh, Caleb, who's 10, who's very cheeky, as you're about to find out, and Joss, who's four. His love language is fighting. And Caleb, who's 10, came up to me in the summer when I was wearing shorts, and he said, Daddy, why don't you take some hair from your legs and put it on your head? I reminded him at that point that genetics is a terrible thing and that she, he should enjoy his Jack Grealish esque locks while he's still got them. There are moments when we have to be real with ourselves and real with God. And the beautiful thing that was teed up so wonderfully by Julie earlier is that we can be real with God because he sees us. Do you know, Julie, that was beautiful. I read, I read that exact passage earlier this week. It's as, if, it's as if there's a God who's speaking to us, isn't it? But he sees you, and you can be real with him because he sees our hearts and knows us. And this is a passage that is real. Because the comparison that this passage makes to who we are as humans is not flattering in the slightest. It says that we're like jars of clay. Now, jars of clay are fragile, easily broken, easily cracked. By the way, this is also, a not, this is also not a jar of clay. I'm not that strong. It's a jar of plastic. I was very disappointed when it arrived in the post. I thought I was really strong at the time when it arrived. But isn't this interesting, actually, how we can be on a Sunday when, when we see people? We can often present a reality that isn't actually how we're doing inside. But with God, we can be real. The bad news in this passage, by the way, I'm an evangelist. I promise to get to the good news. But there's some bad news to, do, to, to deal with first. Because the passage can says that we're hard-pressed on every side. Anyone else feel hard-pressed at the moment? In a world where we've lurched from a pandemic to a cost-of-living crisis, to the threat of World War III, the death of a monarch, political turmoil, we are hard-pressed on every side, often by work and family and life and sometimes church. We are hard-pressed. It gets worse. We're perplexed. I'm sure I'm not the only one in a post-truth, post-Christendom world to have asked the question in the last few years, Lord, what is going on in our world? persecuted. Now hear me right on this. We do not suffer the same levels of persecution as some of our brothers and sisters around the world. I can't imagine that, we're, that Jubilee Church in Afghanistan are meeting with the same freedom today. But yeah, do you know what? There is, there is a real increasing chill factor towards Bible-believing Christians in this nation. Struck down. Now, Bible scholars have looked into that phrase that Paul uses, struck down, and, 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 and say a better translation maybe is that Paul's really struggling with, with anxiety, maybe even depression. His, his soul is heavy and troubled. This is a passage that is real about who we are. And God's encouragement to you today is that you can be authentically real with him, with yourself and those around you. And maybe the first thing that some of us need to do today is actually we know that we struggle, we know that we're burdened with something, but we haven't shared that with someone yet. And maybe the first thing that God's encouraging you to do is find someone you trust and grab a coffee with them this week and say, I was listening to a very excitable bald fella on Sunday morning. Can I talk about my struggles? We can be real with God, with ourselves and with others. Because this passage is even more extraordinary when you consider who wrote these words. Because this is Paul. He's like a super Christian, responsible for writing over half of the New Testament. At the time of writing, he's planting churches all over South Europe and the Middle East. He's at the top of his game. In worldly terms, he's incredibly successful, and yet he's clearly not in a good place. Sometimes the external can project an image when deep down we're struggling. You can be real. It's okay not to be okay. But here's the really good news. I told you I'd get to it. If you're not okay this morning, if you know Jesus, you are not okay like the rest of the world is not okay. It's really important. 
because we're not just jars of clay. If you know Jesus, by the way, if you don't know Jesus this morning, there's going to be an opportunity and to know Jesus because you need to. Because without Jesus, you're just a jar of clay. But with Jesus, the first five words of this passage are true. But we have this treasure. We may be fragile, cracked, broken, vulnerable. But yet if you know Jesus this morning, you have a treasure in your jar of clay. And that treasure changes everything. Because there is hope in your heart. There is light in your darkness. There is life in your dying body. Though outwardly you are wasting away, yet inwardly you're being renewed day by day. The hope in your heart, the treasure in your jar of clay changes everything. But here's the thing about hope. There's been a lot of talk about hope recently, hasn't there? But hope is only of any good if it's in the right direction. We're going to watch a little video clip. Step up here on this chair and close your eyes. All right, and then everybody fill in. And we're going to ask you to fall, and then they will catch you. So you have to trust us. I'm going to count to three. Just relax and fall, okay? One, two, three. No, wait, no, wait. And I want us to be really clear this morning as Christians. Our deepest hope, and hear me right on this, our deepest hope as Christians is not in world peace. Our deepest hope as Christians is not in the NHS. Our deepest hope as Christians is not in the government. It's not in a new monarch. It's not, it wasn't, in England winning the World Cup. Our deepest hope as Christians has a name. And his name is Jesus. See, in the beginning was the author. The answer to the question not yet posed. Solution to a mystery not yet disclosed. Liberator to a regime not yet imposed. And there in the background as the story unfolds. Holding his run from times of old. Waiting as priests, poets and prophets foretold. Of the author of all love and life. And all that is good. And then bang! In a moment that is cosmically linkable. The author becomes unthinkably shrinkable. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. Because the author comes down to meet us, the king of the world becomes a fetus. And from Judean hills, the story was broadcast and some logged on, hooked up, tuned in. And to those who did with a wireless connection, the author promised life and resurrection. Weaving tales, leaving trails, breaking jails, removing scales from people's eyes opens to a kingdom where humanity hails the author. But then, impaled. You see... Love is just words until action prevails. And this point is proven by bloods drawn by nails. And squaring up sin and death, the author wails, it is finished. But that's just the finale of season six. Because in season seven's a box full of tricks. The author smashes death in the face with a spade because hell cannot hold his loving tirade. And for 2,000 years, the story continues. Get yourself plugged in like there's nothing to lose. So reach for your settings and turn your life eye on. Because the author is still speaking, his heart is still beating, and the story is love, and with it he frees us. Because the author has a name, and his name is Jesus. And we are people of Jesus, people of hope. And if there is Jesus in your heart, there is treasure in your heart, and your hope is in the right direction. And that really matters, and that really is good news. But, Paul also then goes on to make a connection between this hope in our heart and our own fragility and brokenness and what happens next. Because in verse 13 he says, It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have this same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. He recognizes fragility, but also says we're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. We're struck down, but not destroyed. And this good news about not being crushed, not being in despair, not being abandoned, and not being destroyed is not just for us. It's for the world around us that so desperately needs to hear it. And I don't know about you, but I am noticing with those around me and the world around me that there is a, the world is hungry for the hope. Because... Its hope is in the wrong direction. 
And now and again it realises it. So it's searching for a hope in the right direction. I believed, therefore I've spoken. The latest person I've seen um, grapple with this is my son Caleb. As well as being cheeky, he, uh, he also listens to me now and again. And uh, my, my first book, Best of Friends, which came out this week, is my second book. My first book um, came out the worst week in history to launch a book. It's called Story Bearer, and it's about how to share your faith with your friends. And it came out the week the pandemic started and all the bookshops closed. My wife tells me it's done surprisingly well. I say thank you very much. But the, the heart behind this book is that all of us have a story to tell, and all of us can be more effective in sharing our faith with our friends. And uh, Caleb, my son, there was absolutely no parental pressure. But at the time, he said, Daddy, can we read your book? So knowing that there was no one reading it because the bookshops were closed, uh, I thought I'd read it to my son. And so Caleb and I went through this book together. And one of the things that, that encourage, it encourages us to do is, is share our faith with our friends and have a list of people who we're praying for regularly to become Christians. And Caleb was seven at the time. He was in a class of 30 at school and in a in a slightly manipulative way to delay his bedtime, his list was every single person in his class. <laughs> so every night, we went through every single person in Caleb's class to pray for to become a Christian. And then one day, he comes back from school really excited. And he says, Daddy, something amazing happened today. And I was like, what? He said, well, today, Jacob became a Christian. I was like, wow. So Caleb, tell me what happened. He says, well, I went up to him, right? I'm already thinking this is, this, is not, this is not what it says in Story Bearer. I said, he said, well, I went up to him, right? And I said, Jacob, do you want to live forever? Jacob says, yes. Caleb says, all right, you've got to become a Christian. Jacob says, okay. Caleb says, all right, you're now a Christian. I said, Caleb, which part of the book did you actually understand? Now, if, if he's sharing his faith like that when he's 37, not 7, we've got a problem. But it does show someone who knows the hope in his heart and knows that it's not just for him. And we are hope people. Our hope is in the right direction. I believe, therefore, I've spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. We are good friends with people. Evangelism should be natural and relational. We tell our story. We live our story. We listen. We're good friends. But the treasure is too great not to overflow into the lives of those around us. But here's the next piece of good news. Not only do we have a treasure in our heart, not only does it overflow, but there's a, there's a holy connection between our own fragility and the news getting out there and how it gets out there. Paul writes in verse 16, do not lose heart. I believe that's a verse for us as a church at the moment, as the world around us is losing its heart. God says to us today, don't lose heart, church. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our lighter momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. At the heart of the Christian faith, at the heart of the cross that we've just sung about, that towers high above it all, there's a beautiful and profound truth, that there is no life without death. And there is something about our struggle and in our vulnerability, in our weakness, that God does his best work. That so often in our weakness, as we grapple and struggle through life, that's where God is at his strongest. It's a verse in Romans that, that says, in Romans 5, that, that, that says that it's suffering that produces perseverance. Perseverance that produces character and character that produces hope. In the furnace of suffering, God refines us. We become more like Jesus. But also, when we're at our weakest, so often God's at his strongest in the lives of others. The person I've seen that, work out some most recently is through my mum. Because almost this time three years ago as the rumours of a virus began to swirl and lockdowns became more inevitable, my mum had been struggling with cancer for about six months. And we found out at the beginning of, as those lockdowns were announced, that my mum's cancer was terminal. 
And so as we were unable to, to, to see her in person and, and, and have physical contact with her, I would spend those early months of lockdown going to sit at the end of my mum's driveway with my then one-year-old. And I witnessed a woman who was outwardly wasting away. But at the same time, this verse was true that she inwardly was being renewed day by day. Because this was a woman who, when she was a young girl, had made a decision to put her hope in the right place. She'd put treasure in her fragile jar of clay. This was also a woman who, who I saw the faithfulness of her life to God. Every morning I'd come downstairs and find my parents reading their dog-eared, leather-bound Bibles in the kitchen. And it was like through her life as she served Jesus and served others and stayed close to the cross that towers above it all. She was investing in a spiritual bank account. And then in those dying days, she was able to make every withdrawal she needed. And then she did something that I would recommend all of us do if we know when we're going. She takes her iPad one afternoon, records a message to be played at her funeral. She always wanted the last word, did my mum. And she tells the story of how that the decision she'd made as a little girl was giving her hope in the present. A certainty of what would happen in the future. Because the cross of Jesus Christ and his resurrection meant forgiveness for her past, his presence in her present, and hope for the future. We weren't able to have a physical funeral in the building, so we did it on Zoom. And over 300 screens turned up, many of whom <coughs> knew Jesus, all of whom knew mum. But there are a few who didn't. And uh, because she wasn't around anymore to stop me, I had the last word at her funeral. And I'm an evangelist. So I gave an opportunity for people to choose to follow Jesus at the end. And as I clicked leave on the end of the Zoom meeting, and turned my phone back on, there was a text from a friend of my mum's. Who said, Phil, I prayed that prayer with you. I believe Jesus died for me. And this was a woman who mum had prayed for for many years. And that's why Paul encourages us in verse 18 to fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And here's my encouragement to you. You will never know the outcome of many of the prayers that you pray. You will never know the outcome of your life well lived, lived in the right direction. You'll never know the outcome of the smiles that you give to people in the street, the words of encouragement that you give, the, the, the words of discipline to your children, the, the arms around the shoulders of your friends. You'll never know the full extent and the full outcome of those. But fix your eyes, not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what's unseen is eternal. And don't write yourself off from being used by God. If Paul, who is hard-pressed, struck down, persecuted and perplexed, can be used by God, so can you. This incredible word of God is full of ordinary people used in extraordinary ways. Didn't you know most of them were an absolute mess? We are fragile, broken. But God can partner with us to do amazing things. One of the last weddings I went to in real life, do you remember, I went to a couple of Zoom weddings. They, were, they weren't very good. The, uh, the bride walking in from the kitchen at one was not quite, didn't quite have the same magical effect. But one of the last weddings I went to in real life uh, was a friend of mine from university. And uh, I, I was, do you ever go to places where you feel completely out of place? Well, uh, well I, live on a, I live on a council estate in Birmingham, and this, this wedding was in this really posh Oxfordshire village. The address was given by a genuine TV personality. I felt completely out of place. The canapes looked so nice you didn't want to eat them. And then you walked through to the, to the reception and there were these long tables with so much cutlery at each place. I think it's more there than I have in my drawers at home. But ev everyone's name was written on these perfect calligraphied name places. You could barely read it. And so I walked through and you do that thing when you arrive at a wedding like that where you try to find your place at the table. So I walked up and down and I'm trying to find my name and I'm staring at this really posh writing and I'm looking for Phil and I, no, I can't find it anywhere. I do a second lap, I still can't find my name. I'm beginning to panic, my heart's beginning to race, and, I, and I'm beginning to wonder what would be more awkward. 
Do I say to the bridesmaids, excuse me, where, where, am, I, where am I living? Or do I, uh, do I just go home? And I decide, to my great shame, I'm just going to go home. So I wander through this Oxfordshire village. I kind of get to my car, and then I sit, sit down. I text my wife, and I'm putting the postcode into the sat-nav. And then I remember that my mate texted me to ask for dietary requirements. And I think he wouldn't have done that just for the canapes. So I resolve in my heart, I'll have one last look. So I make my way back to the venue, and it is so embarrassing. Everyone's sat down, grace has been said, but I'm like, I'm going to do one last lap. So I walk up and down. I get to the third table, and my name has never looked more beautiful. I wanted to do high fives along the rows. I was like, ah! Do you know why I think I missed it? I didn't just have a place at the table. I'd been seated with the family. And here is the beautiful invitation of the gospel. You have a seat at the table. You are seen. God sees you. But not only is your seat at the table, it's with the family. Because the family business is bringing hope to the hopeless. Life to the dying. Light in the darkness. We are good news people in a bad news world. And God's invitation is despite our brokenness, despite our fragility, we have a treasure. Our hope's in the right place. And we live in a world that so desperately needs it. So my invitation to you this morning is to be real. To know God with you. To put your hope in the right place. And let that hope change the world around you. Let's pray, shall we? Just take a moment to reflect on God's word to you today. And the first thing I want to do is there might be some people here today who know that their jar of clay doesn't have treasure in it. Maybe it did and you've put your hope in a different place. My invitation to you this morning is to open the door of your heart to the creator who knows you, to the God of the universe who you don't have to hide anything from, to the king who died on a cross for you so that you might be forgiven and rose again that you might know real life now and life in heaven when you die. If that's you this morning, I'm going to invite you to pray a really simple prayer like my mum did when she was a young girl. And you'll simply say, Lord, I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong. I'm going to choose to put my trust in you. Thank you that your death and your resurrection on the cross means that I can know real life now. And even though I haven't got it all together, I'm going to choose to follow you, God. So if that's you this morning, just invite you in your heart to say to God, Lord, I'm sorry for going my own way. I need you. And I want to know the real life that you give. And I want to know the hope for the future and life eternally when I die in heaven. <coughs> Amen. Just invite you, well, just while every head is bowed. Just invite you, if you prayed that prayer with me this morning, would you do something really brave and just put your hand in the air so I can pray for you? Anyone there so just so I can pray for? Anyone who prayed that this morning? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Great, let me pray. Father, thank you for those who have chosen to follow you this morning. Put their hope in the right place. Father, I pray that they would know you really close. And that they would follow you all the days of their lives. And that the hope that you've given them would spill over into a world that so desperately needs it. Amen. Finally, I just wonder whether there's some of us this morning who need to respond to God. Because we know that we've felt broken and hurt. And we've ruled ourselves out from being used by God. 
We've thought, how can I have an impact in the lives of those around me? We've thought, how can I volunteer at church? We've, we've kind of said, actually, I, I, things are too tough for me right now. But God wants to encourage you this morning that wherever you're at, you have a seat at the table. So just invite you, wherever you are, just put your hands out if that's you. And and going to pray a prayer. God's Holy Spirit to fill us. To remind us who we are, that we are children of God. That we have good works to do. That even though we haven't got it all together, together we've got it. So Father, for those of us this morning who life is hard-pressed, perplexed, persecuted, struck down, would you remind us that in our fragility, you partner with us for your glory. Fill us with your spirit. Enable us to step out. Give us the imagination and just nudge us into the right direction of where we're to serve, who we're to pray for, what we're to say. We thank you that you're with us, that you're for us. And though outwardly we're wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our lighter moments through troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Help us, God, to take heart and to fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what's unseen is eternal. In Jesus' name, amen.